and welcome to Prime Time. Why are we only now learning about the details of another secretive sit down with the U.S. President and Putin and once again learning from Russia? New information emerging that's raising lots of concerning questions tonight. This president conceals what matters with Russia, then creates crises where there are none, like the border nonsense he sells you. But don't take it from me. Even his intelligence chiefs are publicly breaking with him, directly contradicting what the president has been telling you on what we should fear most. Plus, we all know 2020 is going to be a brawl. And we saw some haymakers thrown by Kamala Harris in the big CNN town hall last night. The question, we know she can throw punches, but is she too aggressive on policy, too left to beat President Trump? Another rising star in her party is here. CNN's newest commentator, Andrew Gillum, joins us. What do you say? Let's get after it. All right, the 2020 candidates quickly jockeying for position to take on President Trump. At the head of the heap right now, Kamala Harris. Well, forget about what the polls say. She got the big spotlight in the CNN town hall, and she did a good job in the first official week of her candidacy. You saw her last night making her case for why she's the best one to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Trump. She laid out her left-of-center positions, but is also going hard with a policy that is two steps farther left than anything any centrist would ever offer. Will it work? Here's a taste. And correct me if I'm wrong, uh, to reiterate, you support uh, the Medicare for All bill, I think initially co-sponsored co by Senator Bernie Sanders. You're also a co-sponsor yes. on, on it. I believe it will totally eliminate private insurance. Um, so for people out there who like their insurance, well, they don't get to keep it? Well, listen, the idea is that everyone gets access to medical care. And you don't have to go through the process of going through an insurance company. Let's eliminate all of that. Let's move on. Mm, ambitious. Eliminate private insurance. What does Andrew Gillum think? You know him, former mayor of Tallahassee, Democratic nominee for Florida governor, but now a new title, CNN political commentator. Welcome to Primetime. Hey, good to man. Have you in the family. Good to see you and good to see you in person. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. So just to get something out of the way, yeah. if you are here, does that mean for 2020 you've made a decision to watch? Yeah, I'm absolutely watching, man. I, I um, um, for one, I'm proud to be here, but two, uh, I'm looking forward to what I think is going to be one of the most diverse fields mm -hmm. of Democrats to compete for the presidency ever. Uh, we're going to have a great exchange of, I think, ideas uh, between vastly different individuals who may or may not differ greatly on the policy. Mm. Uh, but I think what we're going to be looking for, not only as a party, but I think as a country, are candidates who we can believe in, uh, folks who get out there and I think uh, connect with people in a way that they can see themselves reflected mm -hmm. uh, and really importantly uh, are not Donald Trump and better than that will cast a vision uh, for the future of where we want to go as a country and not litigate the issues of the past. And, you know, you saw in the governor's race the need to be more than just anti-Trump. Yeah. Policy matters. Where does it put your party? What does it mean? So with Kamala Harris last night, what did you like? What made your brows pop? Yeah. Well, first off, coming off of what I thought was a, a, pure, a pretty uh, spectacular launch uh, the other night, um, I want to applaud uh, Senator Harris for jumping straight into the arena, mm -hmm. uh, going to the voters, uh, doing a nationwide town hall meeting, and quite frankly, not getting softball questions. Uh, she was pinned down on a number of pieces of policy mm -hmm. that over the course of this race, she'll be called to defend. Uh, she'll be called to add uh, further explanation. And uh, she showed herself to be, I think, nimble. More importantly, I think she listened well. And I think she responded honestly. And I don't know what else we would want to, you know, ask for from, uh, from our nominee. Got to judge the ideas. One of the things about coming out of the box is, one, you're one of the first, right? Yeah. First impressions, you don't get a second chance yeah. to make a first impression. Policy-wise, though, she's going to have to own what she's doing on health care. Sure. That may be the defining non-BS issue of the 2020 campaign. Yeah. Who knows where the president takes it? Uh, and what Democrat gets pulled into what rabbit hole with him, what kind of fight they decide yeah. to have. But health care matters. I want to put up some poll numbers because I think it uh, articulates the challenge well. You say to people, Medicare for all, what do you think about expanding access? They like it. But the more you start talking about Medicare, meaning you lose what you have, mm. the numbers start to flip. So you'll see it's positive on that. As you build in more, but you don't keep, but you don't keep, but you don't keep. And when you get to where Kamala Harris was last night, which yeah. is all there will be. 
is single payer. All of those, the majority of the country who gets it through the employer is gone. Is that too far? Well, I, I tell you, there are a lot of ways to uh, skin this. Um, uh, you heard Senator Harris talk about her plan toward doing it. Uh, when I was running for governor of the state of Florida, I talked about a federation of states mm -hmm. where we might come together and use the collective bargaining power of, of, of those states uh, to get better rates and better prices for uh, And to the, deal the with residents. the infrastructure. One of the things that is clever about that is no state, you could argue not even the federal government, can take the transition costs. That's right. But if you create a cooperative, you might. I gave you a hard time about that That's right. because who knows that states, there's so much politics involved. Sure. But you said, well, I got to try. That's right. Harris doesn't have that in her plan. The question is, does she back off of that as it gets out there if people don't like it? Well, I will tell you, uh, first of all, I fully believe that anyone running for president of the United States mm -hmm. needs to be able to put forth a proposal of what yes. they're going to do to ensure 39 million Americans who today don't have access to insurance. Uh, Americans are deeply concerned about what it means to get access, affordability. Too many of us are concerned that we may be one illness away from bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. uh, and we want to know what our elected officials are going to do about it. The reason why I had to throw it out as an idea as a candidate for governor of the state of Florida was because we weren't hearing any real solutions coming from the federal level. But it's the money. Uh, it is the money. It's the money. At the end but of the day, it, Bloomberg made a strong point today, Andrew, he, which he is... Did. Listen, this is expensive. The transition costs. And just so people get it, because, you know, you, you advised me well before we started. Let's not get too in the weeds yeah. on this stuff because you lose people. True. But a simple economic dynamic is to go from private to public, yeah. you would need transition costs in the trillions. True. And the mechanism uh, that makes that OK, there's one social, one financial. The social is you're doing the right thing. Yeah. Financial would be, well, over time, costs will come down. But as we know, politics doesn't usually get settled for the long term. It's usually for the short term. Sure. He's warning people, stay away from it. Do you believe you can sell it to the American people in any way beyond let's use it for the people who don't get insurance through their employers? I, I've got to tell you, first of all, we're looking for candidates who have big vision. Right now, uh, health care costs uh, take up about 18 percent, almost 20 percent of GDP. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a huge segment of the American economy. When we talk about the cost of health care, we almost never talk about the savings that are associated and are inured uh, to expanding access to more people. And so what I would say is, is for those who are hitting uh, Senator Harris on this, put forth your plan. Right. How do you propose to cover more people and how do you plan to pay for and it? Give her a chance to engage on it instead of just criticizing Absolutely. it on the outside. And Harris has to take so, those opportunities. Well, she'll have to take them. But you know what? Every candidate will have to put forth their plan. Right. Uh, this is not enough to simply, you know, rip away at what is being proposed by one candidate. We need to see what is all on the table. And at the end of the day, I think American uh, the people of this country want to know what are we going to do to reduce costs and expand access for more people and get everybody covered. Mm -hmm. Right now, for those who are not covered, we're paying for them anyway because they are showing up in emergency rooms, which is the most expensive and least efficient form of care. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're going to pay anyway, it would be my judgment that we pay smarter rather than more expensive and least efficient. So there's a, so there's a marginal aspect to that, an incremental aspect Absolutely. to it. Uh, and we'll see if that winds up being where the party lines up. Yeah. Uh, but that was a very ambitious start. Now, yeah. as you're here now, as I've gotten to know you in public life, you shy away from nothing. They dogged you with the ethics investigation yes. when you were mayor and taking it into the governor's race. They have found cause to continue to look no solid findings. Sure. What do you want people to know about your position on that? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, although the race for governor took 22 months and a lot of energy uh, uh, spent on these kinds of issues, the politics continue. Uh, I am confident that as we move through this and as uh, uh, a judge looks at the facts, they will determine that I have acted in complete uh, compliance with the law. Uh, what I think people know about me in my state, which is why we became uh, came within a uh, 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 a rounding whisker. era of <laughs> becoming governor of the state of Florida is they believe me to be honest. I've been forthright. Uh, I have tried to level with people uh, squarely. And I honestly think that's the only way to go. Well, you are considered a big deal in your party and part of the future. It's good to have you here good at CNN. Good to be here, man. I look well. forward to working with you. Always. You're always welcome on the show. Thanks, man. You may not want to come, but you're always welcome. I'll be here, man. <laughs> All right. Andrew Gillum, everybody. Welcome to the CNN family. All right. So it was a big deal today. Listen to this. We got this rattling readout today on the greatest threats to America from the people who know the best, the president's intelligence chiefs. What did they not talk about? Take a guess. Our southern border. Why? 
Why would they go and say things about the sitting president that we have never heard from them before? We go to somebody who did the job, who's going to tell us what's going on next. You know him. We are hearing more about the private discussion that took place between the two leaders at the G20, Putin and our president. A new Financial Times report tells us that Trump and Putin spoke for about 15 minutes and did discuss a number of foreign policy issues. And then here's the key part. With no aides or U.S. translator president, present. This news drops in the same day that the president's top intelligence chiefs publicly contradicted him on Russia, Iran, North Korea, and other key national security issues. You have to understand, these are two developments that we have never seen this way in a presidency before. Phil Mudd brings me in right now. Perfect guest for tonight. Thank you for making time. Sure. You've been in these briefings. You've seen this happen. First, the Russia news. The idea of a United States president going into a meeting with the Russian ruler, let alone Putin, without anybody else, without even an interpreter or a translator, how rare, how do you make sense of it? Well, you know, the president can do whatever he wants, anywhere, anytime. I'd have a couple of questions. Number one is a question of execution. The president makes decisions. He doesn't execute decisions. If he decides to do something in Syria, if he decides to do something related to Russia in Eastern, Euro in Eastern Europe, if he decides to do something related to Russia on sanctions, who executes that? The president doesn't. Who was supposed to act on the, on the decisions the president made? I mean, there are other decisions. Let me give you one specific one. The second point I would make. Did the president tell the Russian leader something, an adversary, that is the Russians, before he told an ally? For example, the president has talked about extracting the United States from Syria. Did he express to the Russian president, Putin, that the, that the United States was going to withdraw from Syria before he told the Turks? I, I don't know the answer to that, well, Chris. Nobody but we does. Shouldn't, we don't, but th we shouldn't be asking that question. That's right. That's the answer. The answer should be we had told the allies before we told Putin. The I don't know the transparency is the issue. He doesn't yeah. have to tell me. He doesn't have to tell the media. But he should have his own people yeah. in there. And he doesn't do this with other meetings with foreign leaders. And that adds to the curiosity. Then the other development, which is the intelligence chiefs. You've been yeah. in these meetings. You've yeah. seen these hearings and briefings. The idea that the border wasn't top of their list, not new. It rarely enters into it. What's new is the president making it an existential crisis. But what is also new, Phil, is give me some context. The idea of the intel chiefs going in there and saying, hey, the sitting president, he's wrong. Boy, th this, is, this is a painful moment, Chris. I was there 16, 17, 18 years ago, and we made a mistake. The mistake was saying the American people, whether they elect a president who's a Democrat or Republican, the American people re uh, elected that person. Our responsibility is both to report the facts, but also to support the president mm -hmm. who was elected by the American people. Back before the Iraq war, I think we went too far towards saying maybe if the president said Saddam Hussein's a bad guy, we should give him the evidence to say that. And people, including Vice President Cheney, cherry picked us. I thought today was a great moment for, for, for the American people, including the American intelligence community. American intelligence leaders said, look, we got burned before the Iraq war. We were too far out supporting American politicians today. I don't care what they say. The facts are the facts. We're going to tell them here's the deal. And if it differs from what the president says, so be it, Chris. That's interesting. I respect your candor about back then. And look, I, I remember it well because the country went bad on the media for a while because we were talking about yellow cake and it being yeah, fake. It was and tough. We were told the American people were told that we were compromising our troops in harm's way by reporting this way. And the American people believed and they were deceived. So I respect the candor, but what do you think is going on right now? Do you think this is making up for lessons learned in the past? Or do you think they perceive a specific need in countering what this president is putting out there? I don't think it's either, Chris. Let me make it this real simple. Intelligence doesn't make policy. Intelligence informs policy. You can tell the president the Russians are affecting American elections because they're interfering with Facebook and Twitter. The president can do whatever he wants. You can tell the president, look, the North Koreans has, have not eliminated a single missile or an ounce of nuclear material. The president can do whatever he wants. You can tell the president there are thousands of ISIS fighters in Iraq and Syria. 
the president can do whatever, they didn't whatever, tell whatever him. he wants. They did yes, it in they public. Did. No, they did it in public. Is yeah, what I'm but the, uh, you mean they haven't tell, told him in a, in, a, in a briefing in the Oval Office? I'm not saying they haven't. I'm saying oh, I'm sure that they I have. get. This my part I don't is, get. I've never heard this before. Oh, uh, yeah, but my point is what they're saying is, especially after getting burned on a rock, we're going to tell the president the truth. If he chooses, and that's his choice, he's the person elected by the American people to offer an alter, alternate truth to the American people. That's what he can do, and that's who, the, who they can vote for. But we're going to go to the American people and say, here are the facts. If he wants alternate facts, vote for him. That's not our problem. Well, but that's the new part. I've never yes, seen that before. That's this correct. Is, this is new ground to see them coming out and counter a sitting president. Phil Mudd, thank you for the candor and for the perspective. Always a pleasure. All right. I want to go back to the big race that we started the show with. Uh, we are seeing immense enthusiasm already, certainly among Democrats. This is an election that they believe is existential, that they need to unseat President Trump. Now, that's powerful medicine in politics. That means that being anti is a big piece of what they want. But what else will it take? You heard Kamala Harris, the senator from California, take a position on Medicare for all here on CNN that goes very far and is not going to be easily a point of consensus. Critics are pouncing. But is there also an advantage for her in where she is right now? It's a great context for a great debate. Let's have it next. This is CNN Breaking News. And they're off. The 2020 race is off and running, and the first real dust-up is going to be over this massive idea of what to do for health care. You're going to hear many on the left talking about Medicare for all, but that can mean different things to different people. Kamala Harris is taking heat from Republicans, as well as folks like Schultz and Bloomberg, you know, the big shots with big bank accounts who are on the outside as businessmen. They're saying that last night, her support of getting rid entirely of private health insurance is too much. Let's debate what this means for a very crowded field. We got Van Jones and David Urban. Perfect pairing. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> Good to have you both. So, Thanks Van, I, I liked what Gillum said. Uh, Gillum is a smart guy, and he wrestled with this issue down in Florida. And I remember testing him on it, and he was like, look, I know the transition costs are big. You definitely need Medicare for all for the people who don't get insurance through their employers. We've got to figure that out. Then we have to figure out the cost savings. That's as far as he would go. The idea of getting rid of private insurance, is that just ambitious or is that too much? Listen, uh, I, she's not saying get rid of private insurance for stuff you need insurance for. <clears throat> for instance, you need insurance for stuff <laughs> that you aren't certain about. For instance, fire insurance. You aren't certain if your house is going to catch on fire, so you get insurance. You need a farm insurance, crop insurance. You're not certain. Here's one thing you're certain about. You are going to get sick. You are going to die. You, you don't need insurance for that. You don't need health care insurance. You need health care. And so be very clear. She's saying that for it, it never made sense. And we're the only country that does this to say that we are going to have an insurance program. Uh, FDR did this as a deal. He just did it as a deal to try to, you know, uh, appease his critics. But in Europe, they have health care. They don't have health care insurance. They have health care. And she's trying to say, let's do that here. Now, is that too far for the American people? I don't know. But nobody can explain to me, I know why you need insurance for your house burning down, because you aren't sure if it's going to happen. I know why you need insurance for your crops. You don't know if they're going to fail. Why do you need insurance for something that everybody is already sure about? And that's the argument against health care insurance as opposed to health care. So the strong point, Dave, is, is coverage. People need coverage. <clears throat> the big question then becomes, how do you pay for it? Right. And you saw Harris's idea. It makes you very happy. No, Chris, listen, <laughs> and, and Van's point is, listen, those countries in Europe, they're called socialist countries, Van, right? No, they're they, called they take, No, no, they're not. So they're, Van, listen. You health, health care, listen, health care, you know, mandatory coverage, health care, universal care for everyone, that's aspirational, right? But getting there, as Chris points out, you know, and, and pointed out with the numbers, Chris, that you showed early, you know, people don't want to pay for it. Listen, free things are great. Everybody likes free until you ask them, are you willing to pay for it? And people say, you We're know what, I'm not willing to pay for it. No, Van, listen, I agree. There should be lots of, you shouldn't be, you know, health care costs should not be the highest, which door you walk in a hospital. If you go in the emergency room, it's higher than if you walk in a, a clinic. That's, that's, that's ridiculous. But that doesn't mean we need to scrap the whole system, close down private health insurance companies, and, 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 and make the government run it all. That's not, can, can I know, say, it's, it's, it's a philosophical 
disagreement Republicans and Democrats have. Republicans believe the free market does things better. Democrats believe the government does it better. It's no, a simple fact, true. simple debate. No, listen, the, the, free, the Democrats believe the free market does a whole bunch of stuff better and should do it well-regulated and fair, fair to the people and fair to the workers, fair to the planet. But there's some stuff the free market does not do well. It does not provide uh, public education to kindergartners very well. That's why we have a public education, education system. Uh, it does not you know, provide for a yeah, fire. It does not provide for police. And in the, every other It doesn't take country, care of we, we dangerous reckon, prisoners well. <laughs> you know, the private prison sector, they only do well with the low security and maybe medium security. That's why we do that as well. I get you. Listen, I, it's, I, it's I a get debate, you about the alternative, about, but hold on. Let me ask cost. each of you a tough question, okay? The tough question for you, Van, is now let's say you were to do that. Let's say your party gets behind this model of single payer. Health care, or oh, no, I'm sorry, health insurance for your purposes of how you distinguish the two is one of, if not the largest employer in this country. You would be sweating millions and millions of jobs that you'd have to find a place for in that industry. If you got rid of <coughs> no. private health insurance, you would have a lot of people can, looking can for I jobs, man. What's can, your take on can, that? Can, well, I, well, well, first, what kind of jobs are you talking about? There are layers and layers of bureaucracy when you're trying to get, when you're actually trying to deal with your True, health insurance company. But there's somebody's yeah, job. So, so, so okay, those are great jobs, but look at the jobs that we aren't filling in healthcare. We need a massive expansion of the number of people who are who are nurses, especially for the elderly, mm -hmm. and we can't do it on the basis of what we have right now for millions and millions of people. Yeah, but that and doesn't so, mean you throw yes, out the whole you may, system. You may man. lose some bureaucrats. I will trade in bureaucrats for nurses any day. But you're just talking about putting on layers and layers of bureaucrats with the government-run no. health system. Medicare no is the most right, well, efficient. Now Okay, the now Medicare hold on. So hold on. So now here's the tough and the most popular. Go ahead. Now I hear you on that. I get you. I get you about the transferability of where there'll be need, and you'll have to transfer jobs. I hear you about that. Valid answer, Dave. Tough question for you. Sure. By getting rid of the mandate, you guys exposed the problem with healthcare. You didn't fix it. You exposed it. If you don't have the pool as big as we can get it. If it's right. just guys like us, or just like you and me, it's gonna be expensive. Van probably has been to a doctor in 10 years. He's healthy as a horse. But the, <laughs> if we don't have the young guys in there, right. the young men and women, this and is by problem. getting rid of the mandate, you created a problem. The costs are running crazy. This administration has done nothing about them. Whereas this may be hyper ambitious, what are you guys gonna present in the form of President what? Trump that yeah, comes listen. back? Listen, Republicans have a failure of ideas here. That's why this is a vacuum is being filled, mm. right? They're, 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 the, 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 I, I am of the fix it, don't trash it school, right? Uh, the, the, the overly ambitious Republican Congress should have tried to tweak what the Obama plan does, not throw it out. There, there are lots of common sense things that can be done and, and you don't have to scrap the entire system. I think there, there's, there's this false choice of either you have completely government funded healthcare or you have a completely private system. There's, there's probably, there's, there are many ideas that, that fall in the middle that are, that are very, that are very viable. And, and unfortunately, it's an incredibly political issue, as you note, and, and the sides can't come together. Just but like there you is can't no come together more important security. domestic policy issue. Van, last point to you. Yeah, well, listen, um, everybody knows immigration is an important issue. Donald Trump took out the most extreme position, the wall, the wall, the wall. And now at least we have to talk about the issue. I think when you take a strong position and a passionate position the way that she did, I think it actually moves the debate in your direction. I, don't, I have not heard her lay out how she would get there, what the transition time is. She's got plenty of wiggle room to make this a little bit more palatable if she wants to. But I am proud <laughs> that you got Democrats out there with strong answers for strong problems. Yeah, but, you know, they're going to continue. Now, someone's going to come to her left, Van. You know how this works. No one's going to – the primaries aren't run to the center. They're run to the, the fringes of the parties. Mm. Look, hey, if, 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 if Democrats run to the aid of people who need to see doctors, if Democrats run to the aid of people who need to see nurses who can't see them right now, I'm, I keep running. I keep running. I'll <laughs> tell you what. I'll, I'll tell you what. Here's what we all agree Again, on right at what now. cost? No reason to be creating crisis. Because we got plenty of real ones, and the cost of health care is Chris, one this, that's hitting people right. all over this country. And, and smart people could sit down and solve this. Well, this can be solved. That, that's I true about that. a lot of things. And as you said, politics often gets in the way um, and creates, shall we say, a wall. False narratives. All right. Brother Urban, Brother Jones, I love you guys. Thank you for making <laughs> my you. show. We love, love you back, back, Chris. We love you back. We well. love you back, brother. Not guilty. <laughs> That was Roger Stone's moment and his plea once again today in front of a judge, seven criminal charges in the Russia probe. He says, no way you can't get me. The acting AG got some eye pops when he suggested that Mueller is almost finished. Why is he talking about this? 
And what did he mean by review? What is going on with this probe? What is the right way for these things to be handled? Oh, oh boy, do we have a great guest for you to do that tonight. The man who did the job of Attorney General, Mr. McCasey, joins us next. The president is now putting distance between himself and Roger Stone. He didn't really work for the president on this campaign when it mattered. His longest political associate entered a guilty, uh, not guilty plea today. He says you'll never get him. Then the acting AG sparked outrage uh, about reviewing the Mueller findings. What did he mean? Well, his comments added fuel to a bipartisan push to make everything that ends up in Mueller's final report public. So there's lots to sort out with former Bush Attorney General Mike Mukasey. Always good to see you, sir. Good to be with you. So imagine that. He would never have entered a plea of guilty. That's for sure. Roger Stone believes they'll not never a, get not him. Not an arraignment. That's exactly for sure. Right. That would have been very odd. Um, so the idea of just in general what's happening here, let's start with something that I need your help with because you did the job. When Mueller gives his report, as it says, a confidential report to the right. AG or the acting AG or whomever gets it, what review is allowed by the DOJ before it goes anywhere else? Well, the, the, the regs authorize a public release of whatever can be publicly released. That's the determination of the attorney general. As you said, when it's given to the attorney general, it's a confidential report. Also, if there's any recommendation that the special counsel makes that the AG thinks he shouldn't follow, then the AG has to report to Congress about what those recommendations are and why he's not following them. But other than that... So there's built-in transparency. Even if he decided to negate what right. Mueller says should be done and what right. is, he would have to go to Congress. Okay. But under, understand there are things that are being done now. There are prosecutions that are being right. handled now. So that, I think, is principally going to be the responsibility of the new attorney general when he's confirmed, as he will be, I think, in a couple of weeks. Now, Barr said, hey, look... My main influence here is to get the people as much as I can. Right. Do you think that happens? Do you think that there won't be a real question about how much of the Mueller report made its way to the media and to the American people? Some people are going to raise questions no matter what he does, unless he discloses every single comma and semicolon. But I don't think there's going to be a serious issue because he said he's going to err on the side of, of disclosure, and I believe him. And also, you got Congress as a check. Correct. Also, those committees um, are going to get whatever Mueller now, puts out. what he might conceivably do, I suppose, and I don't know whether he's going to do it, is to delay the release of the report until the lawyers for whoever's mentioned in the report and criticized have a chance to look at it and file a statement of their own responding to it so that you don't get one side before the other. Could take a long time. Not necessarily. I don't think this, I mean... Both sides have been working on this for a while. I mean, he can give him a week, he can give him four days, five days, whatever. Hmm. And that doesn't change the report. It just no. adds on to it. There could be Correct. an appendix. Right. All, right. All right, so I get that. Then you have Whitaker saying, oh, yeah, I think it's going to wrap up soon. Nobody has said anything. You wouldn't have said anything. Why right. did he say that? I don't know why he said it. And um, that may just have been his sort of his offhand observation. Um, I don't know what it's based on. Um, he said I, I was just fully briefed. Yeah, that I wouldn't, I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock in that. Why not? Uh, he's been fully briefed, but the question of whether that expectation is reasonable mm -hmm. based on the briefing he got is something that nobody knows, including him. All right, now I want to put you in the position that you like least, uh, which is where owning, I want you to own the decisions of the president uh, on this very important issue about disclosure to the American people about his meetings with Vladimir Putin. Make the case for why it's okay that he keeps meeting with this man and does things to conceal it, not just from us, but from staff. How is it okay that he keeps doing this with just this man? Chris, thanks very much, but that case can't be made. You must make it. That's why you're here. Yeah, well, um, if you got somebody who will apply thumbscrews, maybe you'll get it. But there are so many reasons not to do that, that it's hard to know where to start. I mean, the idea of, I mean, look, we all lived through Helsinki, right? I was there right. for that. It's not the first time he did it. Twice he denied um, his own intelligence people and sided right. with Putin. He went in, now we learned today, that they went in and had a meeting that no record was released of, the Russian side released it, and he had nobody with him. You have no authoritative view of what happened at that meeting from our side. Um, any deal that's made, if a deal is made, um, isn't provable from our side. It's maybe provable from mm -hmm. theirs, but not from ours. 
Um, there is nothing to recommend it. And then there's also suspicion about whether something was discussed relating to deals or whatever, mm -hmm. um, which people have raised before. The readout, again, it's from the Russians, so who knows how, how true it is. But the, the reporting says they did discuss Syria. And then not long after the meeting, we saw that the president took a new position on Syria to pull out troops. Right or wrong, it's just about the timing. So to tell, to tell our adversary before, an ally. before we tell an ally, um, if that happened, if it happened, right, uh, if they discussed Syria and what was discussed was a dis disclosure of what we right. were going to do. Um, it, be, it was before he told members of our own military. Right. Now, my early defense of this proposition a few meetings ago used to be, well, maybe this is just his thumbing his nose at the media and saying, now, you guys make too much of everything I do with this guy. I'm not going to let you know anything. But I can't make that case anymore because he keeps it quiet from his own people. And it's happened too many times. And the question becomes, maybe I don't have any proof of a crime. Maybe Mueller doesn't have any proof of a crime. But why do they keep lying about Russia and concealing things around Russia the way the president and people around him do if there's nothing to hide? Um, some people, man, I used to have a client who would, as one of my, one of my partners said, would, would lie when the truth would do. Um, it may be that it's that. Um, it may be that he's just playing games. I don't know. Uh, and I'm not going to speculate here. But I think it is, from a policy standpoint and from an operation standpoint, a disaster. But also political. I mean, look at Roger Stone. White House comes back. It has nothing to do with the president. It can have nothing to do with the president. Forget about the obvious. Yeah, it's it, his campaign. It actually, it actually can have some, nothing to do with the president. It's his campaign. That, that indictment, by the way, suggests the non-existence of a conspiracy. But go ahead. How does it exist? Uh, how? How do you get to that? Two ways. Um, number one, you know the paragraph that everybody made a big deal about, about how somebody Directed asked by, him yeah. right, to go ask Assange what he had and when it was going to be released? Right. If there was a conspiracy, Chris, he would have known what he had and when it was going to be released. You're talking that's about to satisfy the criminal definition. Yes. But yeah, but see, that's not my standard. That has never, as you know, this has never been, I get it that it's yours, but I think it's but too it's, convenient a standard. But it's, it's Mueller's standard. That's what he was sent for to do. For a crime. Well, no, no. When you look at the readout for him, yes, he's looking for crimes, but he's also looking for coordination. No, he was. And proof of contact. Not at all. It's he right in the mandate. He may be, no, the mandate was to investigate criminal violations. That is in there under the main statute, but the actual directive says to look for proof of coordination or contact. And I'm just saying, let's say there is no crime, there's no conspiracy. What I'm saying is, if you knew that your guy was going to Assange to try to get the WikiLeaks information early to help your campaign, and you told us you never knew anything about it, that is political malpractice. And that is something that could spark political action against you. Because Correct. high crimes it and misdemeanors spark. is a non-existent legal standard. Well, it's not, it's not a legal standard. That's um, right. But it is, it, is a, it is a political standard That's right. with... What are you meaning? looking for in there? What do you have? Um, I was, you I were was looking just, for the I, mandate. I'm telling you, correct. I put it up on the screen many correct. times. You're um, right that the special counsel uh, law, that's Section 600 or whatever, says you're looking for crimes in this area. No, I'm but, talking about the letter. Yeah, the letter Rod says, Rosenstein look for, sent. I'm telling you, I'll bet you lunch, that it says, look for proof of coordination or contact. And I'm just saying, the idea that it has to be a felony to be wrong, th to me, doesn't pass political muster. No, the, you don't appoint a special counsel to look for anything other than defined crimes. I know, look but when this report comes out, if it's the case that the president's guys were trying to get an advance to help their campaign of Russian ill-gotten gains, and he knew about it and lied to us, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. The question is whether um, it's an impeachable deal. I don't know that it is. Understood, because that's going to be about um, political will right. and but, what the people but the, want. But the stuff in there suggesting that they were looking for, or that he was asked, that, he that Stone talked about getting information that could only have been on Hillary Clinton's server. Well, we never got that. That suggests that he didn't know what he was talking about. Maybe. That's always a case. But I'll tell you what. They were searching for other communications for a reason, uh, the feds, because based on that indictment, they have all the proof they need already to make a case against him for, uh, for false statements. So I wonder what else they were looking he, for. I think we'll he's, see. yeah, the false statements things are kind of beside the point. The point is conspiracy. Right. And there's no proof of that. Well, he wasn't no, charged no, with it either. Correct. Nobody's been charged with it yet. But again, that assumes that the only thing that matters is that a felony was created. And if there wasn't a felony committed, well, then everything's okay. It's the only, the only thing that matters to a special counsel. Hmm. Not to the American people. Mr. Mukasey, always a pleasure. I Great always to... seem to lose, and yet I feel good about no, it you at don't. the end of all no, of you these. No, you don't. <laughs> no, I appreciate you helping the audience. These are complex things, Thanks. and you help us see through the chaos. I appreciate it. Enjoy it. it. Thank you. All right, so it's wintertime. You know what that means. It's cold. In some places, really cold. 
How could there possibly be global warming if it's so cold outside? Ha! Ah! It's not me. That's the president. Yup, that's what he said. And now here comes science next. Thank you.